Wes, we poke for pound pups coming at you vlog 16. It's been a few weeks since we've talked and that's because I got the dreaded tap on the shoulder. So at my favorite card room up here in Washington, Fortune Poker, before I even sat down last time and got my phone out, I was told that I can no longer film on the property. That happened again the next time that I went. I, I didn't film either time. Obviously I complied with the directive. I don't want any trouble. I'm gonna abide by any rules. But it's a little bit disappointing to kind of be a marked man. Um, you know, the purpose of the channel is to kind of track my poker journey and then ultimately to raise money for shelter dogs. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. So that was a little bit of a bummer to get that news because now it means I'm going to have to get a little bit more creative, um, either playing at different establishments or, you know, just having to hold off on putting vlogs out there. Obviously, I don't want to do that. I'm hopeful that I can have a conversation with management. They told me that the reason for the rule is because of concern for both players and dealers, uh, privacy concerns. I'm usually pretty good about making sure that I don't show faces and if faces end up on the film that I either, you know, block them out with a smiley face or put some crazy looking dude on there instead. Um, but for whatever reason, people had an issue with it. So I'm a marked man. And now when I go into Fortune, I can't film. So now I need to find a different place to play if I'm gonna keep these vlogs coming out. The other bit of bad luck is that I recently went to Vegas a couple weeks ago and I stupidly forgot my phone stand. So when I went to these places where I am able to film a session, I wasn't able to do so with my stand. I ordered a new one off of Amazon, tried to get it delivered to the hotel, that didn't work. Then I tried to film without a stand, kind of, you know, like Brad Owen does. That didn't work either, so shout out to you, Brad Owen. Nicely done. Here you can see my failed attempt. This is probably the best piece of footage that I got from the whole trip. Speaking of the whole trip, I ran pretty bad. It was really boring. I just didn't have many good cards. Uh, three sessions, all boring, all losing sessions. I didn't get queens, kings, or aces a single time. Uh, played at Red Rock, got it all in with two pair and a flush draw and lost. Uh, later at Red Rock, I got it in with the nut flush on the flop and somebody sucked out with a full house. Um, and then my later two sessions at the Venetian and Win Encore just didn't go well either. Just couldn't get anything going. So a little bit of bad luck recently with poker operations. After our hand histories from today, we'll talk about our profits in 2023 compared to 2022. I know we're three or four weeks behind the end of the year, but I do think it is important to kind of show you some of the progress that we've made. Again, that's the whole purpose of the channel, show the progress and the growth on the poker front, and then hopefully ultimately be entertaining enough to make some money for dogs. We're not there yet, but we are making progress. We'll talk about that at the end of the video. Let's go ahead and jump into our first filmed session of 2024 on Poker for Pound Pups. Literally the first hand that we play is of course unfilmed. I raise king queen suited, go three ways and flop the nut straight with a backdoor flush draw. I end up getting it all in and doubling up. So before you know it, our stack has gone from 300 to over $600. And our first filmed hand is king nine of hearts on the button. Plus one raises to 15 and gets called by the hijack, us, and both blinds. So we go three ways to a flop of six, six, four with two hearts. We've got two over cards and a flush draw. The small blind donks for $40. Now he's been a completely wild player, so this really doesn't mean anything. The big blind calls and I'm not going anywhere with two over cards and the flush draw. The turn comes in a brick two. The small blind slows down now and checks and watch what happens with the big blind. He slides in one stack and then slides in the rest of his stack and the dealer says nothing. I speak up and say, what's the bet? The dealer says, what are you calling? I say, well, it looked like a string bet to me, but I just want to know what the bet is. The dealer says, well, I can't call a string bet. So what are you calling? The floor gets called over and I again explain, I don't think it should be on me to determine what is legal and what isn't or what the bet size is or isn't. But to me, I say it looked like a string bet. The dealer says, yes, that was a string bet. I just can't call it. You had to call it. The floor then walks away and the big blinds bet becomes $26 instead of him being all in for $126. Is this status quo at your casinos? 
I'm used to the dealers being the ones who say what's legal, what isn't, what the bet size is or isn't, what you can and can't do. It's really strange to me that it should be on the onus of the player to be the one to say what another player did or didn't do. I'm guessing that the rules are the way that they are to protect the dealers from bad vibes from other players. But the consequence is that it puts the player in a weird spot to kind of be the one tattletailing on opponents. So I didn't love it, but I'm certainly going to pay $26 to see a river. So I make the call and the small blind who donked now folds and gets out of the way. Hoping for a king, a nine or a heart, but the river sadly comes in the queen of spades. But the big blind slows down and checks. He quickly check it back and he frustratedly turns over 10, seven of hearts. King high is good. We benefit from the technicality. If he had just shoved all in for $126, it makes it really tough to call. Thankfully, this guy made a big mistake and we benefit scooping a pot of $232, moving on to the next filmed hand. King nine suited again, this time on the cutoff. We get a couple limpers and bump it up to 25 bucks from the cutoff. The small blind's a wild player. He's all in for less. The low jack and the high jack both call. And we go to a flop of king, queen, three, two spades and a heart. The low jack looks like he wants to bet, but he ultimately taps the table. The hijack checks as well. And we see bet to $55, thinking we probably have the best hand here more often than not. The low jack calls quickly. The hijack calls as well. So we've got a pot of $245 and get the turn of the jack of diamonds. This time, the low jack acts on his impulse and fires out a donk bet of 200 bucks. The hijack folds and I just can't fathom him betting $200 here with anything worse than what I have. I show my king and fold and he turns over king of spades, six of spades. I totally understand if he wanted to check raise on that flop, but it didn't really make sense for him to just donk out on the jack of diamonds turn. Nevertheless, his abnormal play gets it done. I fold the winning hand, the small blind mucks, and both the main pot and the side pot go to the villain seated in the low jack, seat number one. We will cross paths again with him soon. For the first time in what feels like forever, we wake up with pocket aces, this time from the small blind. It folds around to the button who makes it 15 to go. He's probably just trying to steal the blinds, but nevertheless, hopefully he's got something. I'm gonna go ahead and raise. I make it $50, and then I realize I've made a mistake. I've been paying too much attention to the football games on TV, and it turns out under the gun plus one was actually the first one to raise to make it 15, and the button was just calling. So really, I should have gone bigger with my raise. Thankfully, under the gun plus one, re-raises in four bets to 125. The button gets out of the way and I stick in the call. Some of you may be thinking, well, you should five bet this, especially out of position. But A, we're in Washington, so there's a max of three raises per street, so I can't. And even if I wanted to, he's only got about 260 bucks left in his stack. So I think the best play is just to go ahead and put in the call here, even if we could come back over the top with a five bet. We're going heads up out of position to a hideous flop of 10, nine, eight. It's hideous for aces, but when you think about my opponent's four betting range, this is most likely gonna miss him. At best, he's got tens, but for the most part, a four bet is queens are better and occasionally ace king. So while I would usually hate this flop with aces the way that it's played out, I actually feel really good. I'm gonna go ahead and check to the four better and he puts in a continuation bet of $100. So again, he's got 160 bucks left. Considering the range that I put him on, I think I'm ahead. If he's got queens or kings and I go all in, I think he's gonna snap call with an overpair. But if he's got ace king, am I really gonna get a lot more money out of him if I just go ahead and call and then another scare card comes in, putting four out there to a straight? So I think now's the time to just go ahead and put him all in, that's what I do. We fade the snap call, so we know we're ahead now. And after about 15 to 20 seconds, he makes the call. The turn is a six, the river is a king, and he shows ace-king offsuit. He didn't even have a flush draw, so he just felt pot committed. 
We take down this $785 pot. Thank you, Poker Gods. Always nice to get aces against Ace King. It seems like there's one hand in every session where I just get myself into trouble by getting a little bit too sticky. So I really shouldn't be getting sticky against these opponents that hardly ever bluff. This time around, I've got pocket eights, the gun limps, the hijack raises to 30, and instead of three betting, we just play it passive and call, which invites under the gun to come along as well. So we're going three ways to a flop of jack, four, deuce with two hearts. Now heads up against an aggressive opponent, this really is a pretty good flop for eights, but multi-way, when I just call with eights, I'm essentially set mining. I check, under the gun checks, and the hijack sticks in a continuation bet of 70 bucks. The hijack has not been super aggressive today, I haven't seen him bluff once, and with one player behind me still to act, this needs to be a fold. But I get sticky, I put in the call for 70 and under the gun folds. So now we're heads up and we go to the turn of the nine of diamonds. I check and the hijack checks it back. If we get a low river, we might have a winner. That doesn't happen though, as the river is the ace of clubs. I give up on my hopes and dreams for this hand and check. The hijack quickly checks it back. I turn over my eights and he shows pocket tens. If I'm going to play conservative and just set mine, I need to get out of the way, multi-way, and fold to aggression against a player who hasn't shown any bluffs. Red pocket kings on the button. It's a limp fest and it gets to me and I bump it up to 25 bucks. The good news is we get action. The bad news is that we get action from four other players and things get worse. When we see that dreaded ace on the flop, the ace magnets come through again. When it checks to me, I'm not even going to try and just represent a strong range on this one. I check it back. One of these other four players has to have an ace in their hand. Let's hope we get there with a the king on the turn. Sadly, we do not. The low jack bets when it gets to him, and I just go ahead and toss my kings into the muck. Oh well, better luck next time. Let's turn things around with the ladies under the gun. I decide to limp, thinking that somebody down the line is going to come over the top and open things back up. Under the gun plus one limps, but the low jack comes through for us, raising to 20 bucks. Small blind calls, big blind calls, and now I spring my trap, I raise to 110. One by one, they all flee for their lives, and we take down a $65 pot. Nothing monumental, but anytime you can take some kind of win with jacks or queens, you take it. Literally the next hand on the big blind, we get eights. Under the gun plus one raises to 15. The button in seat one makes the call. And this time I elect the aggressive route. I three bet to $65 and they both fold again. Seat one makes a comment about me getting good cards. I say nothing and just smile. You know it's gonna be a good session when you get aces multiple times and you get action both times. I'm under the gun plus one and I raise to $20 with a best hand in poker. The button calls, the small blind calls, and the big blind in seat one raises to 80 bucks. Not really much to consider other than what size and I settle on 220. The button folds, the small blind folds, and the big blind comes along. We're going heads up in position with a pot of almost 500 bucks. The flop comes 10-3 deuce two hearts and a diamond. And before I can figure out what I'm doing, the big blind donks for 150 bucks. Remember earlier on in the session, I flopped top pair with king nine suited. He called me on the flop and then an inconsequential jack came on the turn and he donked for $200. So just because he's leading out here doesn't mean he has something. He thinks he's got some potential. I could see him doing this with jacks or queens or maybe ace 10. Maybe he's got a flush draw with like ace queen. In hindsight, I think the right play is probably just a call. Anyway, in the moment, he just felt super strong. He didn't have the chance to come back over the top preflop because we have the three raise maximum. So for him to just go ahead and lead out on this board, I think he's going to have over pairs a lot of the time. So I want to get the money in now before a scare card comes. He makes it 150 and I raise him the max of 450. 
leaving myself about $160 or $170 left. He thinks about it for a while and ultimately folds. He asked me what I had, and he's been a friendly guy, so I tell him I had the best hand there. After we talk a little bit longer, I learn that he has Queen Jack suited and let it go. He asked the dealer to run the board out and said he would have missed his flush, but hit the queen. So that's interesting. I never would have put him on a three bet out of the big blind on Queen Jack suited. Certainly not after I bumped it up to 220 preflop and he called. The pocket pairs are coming through for us and let's see if we can stay hot. Somewhere middle position with ace 10 of diamonds, I open things up to 15 and get three callers and we go to a flop that's pretty good. Queen of diamonds, seven of diamonds, deuce of diamonds. For now, we've got the nuts. Four ways I decide to just go ahead and check, hoping somebody with either a diamond in their hand or a queen in their hand will go ahead and lead out. But that doesn't happen. It checks around and we go to the turn of the three of clubs. I'm obviously wanting to build the pot now, so I put something small out there, just trying to entice somebody to come along for the ride. I make it a big old 20 bucks, the low jack calls, and the other two players fold. The river comes out clean, it's the nine of hearts, so I have the nuts. Again, I just wanna put something out there that's gonna get a little bit of action, and if somebody has something really strong, they can just come over the top. I make it 30 bucks, and the low jack comes through for me. He raises to 75. He moves his stack closer to the table, which is nice because I wanted to look anyway, and shows that he's only got 80 bucks left. So if he has anything, he's gonna call me here. I'm all in for 80 bucks more, and he doesn't hesitate to slide his chips into the middle. I show that I've got the nuts, and he shows that he rivered a set of nines. Really bad last card for him. We are just blazing hot today, scooping another pot and felting somebody again. Last filmed hand of the night is the same hand that we got the day off to a good start with, King Queen of Diamonds. Now there is some backstory that's necessary before we get started. The button is a kid and he's straddling. I played a couple hands with him previously where he was a straddle where I raised and then he called. I totally whiffed on the flop and when I checked, even on boards that shouldn't have hit him, he bet. So I make it 40 to go with King Queen suited. Sure enough, he calls again. Once he calls, I decide my strategy is if I totally whiff, I'm just gonna go ahead and try and take it down with a bet. And if I hit, I'm gonna check raise him. So we go to a flop of nine, five, five with two diamonds. We've got two over cards and the flush draw, so I'm feeling pretty good. I decide that my equity is high enough to where I wanna set the trap. So I check and sure enough, he bets 40 bucks. I give it a few seconds before check raising to 125 and he makes the call. He's only got about 200 bucks left, so we're probably gonna shove almost any turn here. It comes in the four of hearts, so we miss, but I still think we've got a lot of equity. I'm all in trying to fold out all of those mediocre pocket pairs that he might have. He doesn't take too long before calling, so we are all in with king high, but the river comes out, the king of spades. We show king queen and it is good. He tosses his cards into the muck face down so we never find out what he had. Maybe he had a weaker flush draw? Uh, we'll never know. Nice to get lucky again and take down a $740 pot. We give it one or two more orbits. Don't pick up any exciting hands that are worth showing you guys. So we cash out after about six hours of play, in for 300 and out for 1827 a profit of over $1,500. Gotta enjoy it when you're on one of those heaters because they don't happen very often. I will take it and enjoy it. Probably a few mistakes. Maybe I shouldn't have fast played those aces, but it's just good to run good. Nice to log a positive winning session for the first film session of 2024. At the beginning of the year, we had a whopping 11 subscribers. That was purely from a couple slot videos that we posted. And now we are at 415, so you can do the math on the percentage growth that is. Our first poker video we put out a little over six months ago in the summer, so it's pretty cool to see the drastic increase in subscribers from basically starting mid-year at essentially zero to getting to 415 where we are today.
If you haven't seen the first vlog, it's kind of janky. I'll put a link to that first vlog in the description below. You can see how far we've come and you can also learn about why we put the channel together and what the purpose is. All right, here is the original logo put together by yours truly on Canva. You can see a couple of iterations that we got. We ended up using an artist from Fiverr. We probably hired four or five people to get some different ideas. Here are the different concepts that we got. Obviously, we landed on a pretty good one, or at least one that we're happy with. In 2022, we didn't play any 3-5 or 3-5-10 whatsoever. We did play quite a few 1-3 sessions. In fact, we played 37 sessions, and we averaged 26.59 per hour. Sticking with the theme of 1-3, we played 54 sessions of 1-3 in 2023, and we averaged 37.62 per hour which is a 41% increase. We didn't play any 3-5 in 2022. Mainly that was because we didn't think we were good enough and then also because we wanted our bankroll to be able to sustain some of the swings and variants that come along with playing at bigger stakes. So we didn't play any 3-5 in 2022. In 2023, we played 52 sessions, an average of 1790 per hour. Definitely not something that we could make a living off of, but it was cool to make progress to be able to go from 1.3 to 3.5. With that being said, since we're making more at 1.3, do we just keep playing 1.3? I don't think so. I think we keep playing both. At some point, we want to get good enough to where we can potentially be able to make a living from playing poker, and I just don't think that's possible playing 1.3. However, at 3.5, there's that possibility. If I get good enough, I'm just not there yet. Anyway, it's good that we made some progress in 2023. It's cool to be a for-profit player, and hopefully we'll do even better in 2024. Regardless, thanks for coming along for the ride. I'm obviously making mistakes every time that I play. Best way to get better is to learn from the mistakes that I make. So please don't hesitate in sharing your thoughts. That's one of the main reasons we do the vlog, and we're looking forward to making some money for some dogs. Thank you for watching. I'm Wes, signing off for Poker for Pound Pups. We'll see you on vlog 17. Happy 2024. Hey, everybody. Subscribe here to catch the latest episodes. Also, hit that like button and share these videos with anyone who might enjoy them. Doing that really helps the channel and its goal to support dog shelters. So thanks for watching Poker for Pound Pups and have a great day.